Hello, everybody. Welcome into another edition of Head Coach U. I am Brian Fisher, joined as always by former BYU and Virginia head coach Bronco Mendenhall. And Bronco, the line of special guests continues, and, and we got a really special one in, in Tulane's Willie Fritz, who authored the biggest turnaround in FBS history last season. Of course, when, won the Cotton Bowl. Willie, thank you so much for taking time out of the busy schedule and, and jo- joining us here in Head Coach U. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, it, it it's been fantastic to to kind of follow the, the green wave along last year. I I mean, you got you're, you're almost mayor of New Orleans, I think, at this point. I mean, you're more popular oh than, than Zion down there. I see you on on floats after this Cotton Bowl run. What, what's what's been the craziest thing that that's kind of happened to you since uh, you guys got back from uh, from Dallas there? Well, there's been a lot of things that we've done. It's been so great to represent the university. And, you know, a lot of different events. You know, they 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 have an event about every other day in New Orleans. It's uh. A little different than any, slightly different than Statesboro, Georgia, or Huntsville, Texas, or Lawrenceburg, Missouri, some of the places I lived at. But probably the neatest thing that that uh, we did was I was the Grand Marshal of the Endymion Parade, which is one of the oldest Mardi Gras parades here in New Orleans. And uh, I don't know, there is, I've heard anywhere from a million to 800,000 people on the parade route. And uh, they had me dressed up in some wild jacket, and and uh, all my coaches were on there as well. And and uh, you know we came around. I don't know how familiar you are, you guys are with uh, New Orleans, but we kind of turned a corner. We got on Canal Street, and you could see about two miles, and it was about forty deep on both sides of the road, and it was it was just spectacular. And then we went to a we had a at the convention center, they had a big ball, and um, we all went with, uh, you know, everybody, our sports staff, everybody. And, uh, gosh, uh, Foreigner and uh, Darius Rucker play. So it was uh, a nice uh, nice evening, to say the least. In addition to the those kind of events that have come with your success, uh, tell us about New Orleans and what it's like to, to live there, what's it been like for your staff to adjust there, and, and culturally, just what e- each place that you coach, I'm sure, has a very distinct and, and kind of – separate feel what what's the new orleans experience been like well my wife and i loved every place we've lived we, we really do and we still have great connections to all the different towns but i've been in a lot of college cities you know yeah. and, and uh, this is not a college city we're a small university in a big city uh there's just so much to do here it's uh as you said culturally it's a very diverse city uh, you know everybody hears about that that street that starts with the letter B. I can't think of the name of it offhand. I'm just kidding. Bourbon Street. You know, I think I think my wife and I have been down to Bourbon Street five times in the seven years we've lived here. And that's when people from out of town ask us to go to Bourbon Street. You know, it's really a, a tourist uh, spot. But there's a lot of incredible places to eat. We kind of trade the, the top food city with uh, San Francisco. You know, I think seven years I've been, been here. We've had it four times. They've had it three times. Uh, so a lot of great places to eat, uh, a lot, a lot of great museums and, and areas of the city. And, and, uh, you know, you got a little bit of the beachfront, uh, you got a lot of lakes you can go to. And, and, uh, and then the, the French quarter is a really, you know, a, a big area. And, uh, we go down there quite frequently and walk around and just see the different spots, but it's a neat place. You know, the only time I'd been here before I took the job was the convention. You know, and you don't leave the hotel when you're at the convention, <laughs> right, Bronco? You yeah. Know, so uh, uh, we've really enjoyed it. We we love New Orleans. So as you as you mentioned, and you and your wife loving each spot that you've been, uh, I, I'd love to hear more just about that approach because it it, it resonates uh, so much in today's world of the transfer portal, and quite frankly, in the coaching world, right, where the next job when you have success seems to be looming, but it doesn't come unless there's complete commitment and embrace and being embedded where you are with a singular focus. And as soon as you kind of drift from there, um, the, the chance to to be successful seems to diminish. And so it seems like just as I've kind of watched your, you, your career from afar and through a, a common assistant that we'd had in Jeff Conway, um, so from Southern Missouri and Sam Houston and, and so on, um, it, it just seems like each place – became uh, resonant to you and what you're hopeful to build there and only there. And then it'd be kind of surprising when there's another move 
Uh, but then that became, it seemed like from afar that that became the place, right? And all of your effort and time and attention was into that. And I, I'd love just to hear your perspective on that. Well, I think you're a lot more appreciative. I, I You know, you're you're probably one of the few guys. Where would you play college ball at, Bronco? Or, Oregon State. Oregon State. Yep. You know, I, I think it's a lot easier to move up in levels than it is to move down. Mm. At least that's what I see when I when I hire guys. Uh, you know, I played at a small school, Pittsburgh State, Southeast Kansas. I'm a proud gorilla. Yeah. I love the gorillas. I played for a guy named Ron Randleman. And a uh, matter of fact, he he's like a dad to me. I, my dad passed away when, when I was a little younger, and and uh, he, he he was at our spring game here Saturday, and I think he came to heck nine or ten of our games this season. You know, so uh, you know, I just always wanted to be a coach. You know, and I knew that, and and uh, after I got done with uh, uh, you know uh, uh, my my school at. At Pittsburgh State, I, I coached at my high school alma mater. I'm probably one of the few people who coached at their high school alma mater, their college alma mater, and where I got my master's degree. I coached at all three of them. I came back later as a full-time coach and really enjoyed uh, the high school coaching part of it. To be honest with you, I didn't like the teaching as, as much as uh, I liked the coaching. So I, I went down and became a graduate assistant at Sam Houston State where Coach Randleman had moved to after – he coached us at Pittsburgh State, and I was there for two years and uh, coached a year of high school ball in Texas. I'm a proud, you know, Texas high school coach. Coach a place called Willis. Are, are you, Brian, are you from Texas? I'm, I'm from Allen. So if, if anybody Allen, out there is, is, is aware, you know, the, yeah. the old uh, – The University of Allen. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But yeah, you know, I, I mean, yeah, better it, facilities in every place I've ever coached at. Yeah, exactly. That is that is half the battle too. You know, when, when when it's funny you mentioned that, but you know, any Texan they they have that connection to high school football in terms of oh, where'd you play? You know, what you know, what what school does? That's how you know geography in the state of Texas. And and coaches are are, are the same way, especially with recruits nowadays. You know, without a doubt, I I got a, I think a neat story about my time coaching at, at, at Willis, Texas. I, I taught elementary PE. I was a kindergarten, first, second, third grade uh, PE teacher. And I coached varsity football as well. And, and uh, you know, we had, a, I got four classes. I was in charge of uh, corporal punishment at the elementary school. The teachers would bring kids who goofed up down for me uh, to whack, you know, and I didn't want to spank these kids. Heck, they, they hadn't done anything to me. So I, I'd close the door and I'd, I'd hit the table real hard. And I said, don't you do that again? And kids would start crying. Yes, Mr. Fritz. And they'd walk out. Pretty soon the teachers found out that I was not actually spanking them. The kids told on me. But, uh, you know, I had a student when I was there. And years later, I was the head coach at Blinn Junior College in Brenham, Texas. Matter of fact, our, our good friend Jeff Conway was, he and I were GAs together at Sam Houston, and then we were, you know, uh, uh, coached together at Blinn. And I went back to Willis to recruit this kid. And I walked in the door, and he called me Mr. Fritz, because that's what all the kids call me. It was Michael Bishop, you know, and, and Michael, you know, is going in the College Football Hall of Fame this year. It'll be the first kid I've, I've had who's made it to the College Football Hall of Fame. So I always tell coaches, you never know who you might touch, you know, in, in, in this uh, – when you're, when you're meeting people and you're out and about and all these other kind of things. But yeah, I've got great pride in the fact that I'm a former Texas high school football coach. When you consider the places that, that you've coached and, and through the time frame, the uh, I would love to hear just, as you mentioned, Michael Bishop, and I'm sure there's many others. And, and the people to me are the ones that just, they make the coaching, right? It just is so much fun, the interaction and the impact and the influence and, and and being someone of substance and value in their life. I'm wondering what changes you've seen either culturally um, or or as the kids come into your program now at Tulane, right? And if you take that back to maybe when you're at Willis, Texas or at Blinn or anywhere in between, um, do you see the kids being more similar or do you, what differences do you see, if any, that are, are happening maybe in today's era? I don't think it's as different as people let it on to be. I, I have not, you know, I've, I've changed, I've adapted, you know, my coaching style is different. You know, uh, you know, I think this has had a lot to do with, with uh, the changes uh, w w with this age group that we're dealing with. 
Uh, you know, I have, I have some of my guys, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that I don't ever go a day where I don't hear from one of my former players, you know, and, and uh, you know, you know, I, I always know if it's a big game or not after the cotton bowl, I have 493 text messages, <laughs> I, probably were the same way. And a, a, a bunch of them were from former players and, and, and they'll come watch his practice on occasion. We're getting done with spring ball on Thursday. I probably had five, six, seven of my former players that came watch this during spring ball. It's a good time for me to get to sit down and talk and visit and a little more relaxed. But a couple of them did tell me that coach, you've become soft. That's a <laughs> new coach. Cause I coached for some tough guys and, and uh, I probably was a tough guy, you know, as far as discipline and doing things right. We have a saying here, we start behind all lines, we touch all lines, we finish past all lines. I remember you did did the deal with the defensive guys on the sideline and running out on the field. And, and uh, you know, I got that from Joe Gibbs. I went to watch him practice many years ago when he came back to the uh, Redskins, the c- commanders. And, uh, and that was the only sign he had up in the – facility. You probably saw it in there. <laughs> I yeah. bet you wouldn't watch the practice too, but uh, you know, so I, I think the kids have, uh, you know, the social media part is just uh, that, that can be, if a guy doesn't know how to deal with that, I think that can be overwhelming. Uh, you know, and the, but otherwise, you know, if, if these kids know that you care about them, they'll run through a wall for you, you know, if they, if you, you know, and, and, and the other part that, that I feel like I do a very good job of, I'm, I'm very consistent. I, I don't, you know, a guy uh, screws up. I handle it the same way tomorrow as I did today or yesterday. It's something great. I handle it the same way, you know, whenever it occurred. And I think that's where guys get into trouble. Sometimes they're, they're not real. They, they get into coach mode, you know, uh, one of the things I do is I sit in on our, this is one thing I love about spring football is I get to sit in on meetings. Did you do the Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday format? Okay. We did. Yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we, we, uh, meet and lift. And, yes. then, uh, and, uh, you know, Sunday we take off. But what I love about it is my coaches get to sit in on the other side of the ball. Yes. And see different teaching strategies you know, males are visual learners. They have 50% better retention when it's presented to them in color. You know, and, and some of my guys are, I can't do it, but some of my guys are out, outstanding with technology and, and just listening to them in the meetings and jotting down notes on how they can become a better teacher. You know, and, and uh, I love it when guys critique me, how I can become a, a better teacher. You know, this morning I had a guy, he, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? You know what I mean? He had a verbal crutch. And I, I said, hey, you got to get this out of your, your language, you know, if you want to be in, uh, an A-plus presenter. Right now you're a B because of that. Uh, so, you know, I just think being consistent and always trying to improve. I forgot your question. I get off, <laughs> I get off on a tangent and I don't know where I'm going. You know, it, it's really powerful, though. A lot of times staffs and and even head coaches think that they might need to to always leave grounds for a professional visit. And I I always loved, just like what you're saying, um, to to look at the other side of the ball within your own staff. And there are great teachers. And especially so if the secondary coach, right, his first meeting to sit in would be with the wide receivers to understand what exactly, right, provides challenges, difficulties and understanding for himself. And then Right through the course of spring, you have a chance to really see everyone on your staff. And the idea I was taught one time that feedback is a gift. And in the organization, a lot of people, uh, they don't like the feedback or don't want it. But if it's viewed as a gift, man, does that become powerful? And what what also happens is that um, regarding feedback is if feedback is asked for it becomes received at a much higher level. And so much like you were just giving feedback to one of your, your coaches or another professional on your staff, man, if if it can be where the the staff members are craving, how can I improve? What did you see? And all of a sudden it became safe to give feedback and the the giver sometimes hesitates how much to give because, you know, you worried within a staff, you might offend someone or et cetera. I'm talking coach to coach. But if, if, if someone's asking, will you give me feedback, 
And I used to always respond, how honest do you want me to be? And man, when they, if they would then be say, careful what you ask for. yeah, if they would then say, I want to hear everything, man, there's a safe place there for someone to improve. And I don't know, I, I just love the design element that you built in of the meetings in between practice. And I, I think it's really powerful. See, in, in the coaching world, based on how you were, as you mentioned, maybe harder as you started. I felt the same with me and I became more relationship driven over time. Um, and I know expectations are really important. Do you see the young coaches being as prepared as they enter either your staff or that you see them? And do you see that um, our profession, do you think that we're grooming and, and growing and developing the next generation of coaches, maybe to the same way or, or the same level that maybe you and I, as we're similar in age kind of came through? You know, uh, I'm, I'm probably a lot older than you, Bronco. But anyway. <laughs> just a hair. I looked it up. You're just you're just a hair. I'm 57. Yeah. You got me by about five years. Okay, okay. Uh, you know, something that I talk I talked to one of my younger coaches about the other day is, you know, you got to decide whether you want to be a player or a coach. Uh -huh. You know, I watch his interaction. Yeah. And and sometimes, you know, I I see the player cross that line because. He feels like he's one of his peers instead of his coach, his mentor, his role model. That's what I want him to be. So I talk about that all the time. You know, so, something too you were just talking about. I wrote that note down about feedback is a gift. I got two mentors that I have, a guy named Dick Foster. He's passed away. He was head coach at Coffeyville Community College. I was his assistant. He's an amazing guy. And then Coach Randleman, obviously, who I played for at Pittsburgh State coach for him on a couple different occasions. You know, they both had a list of of uh, 29 items. They must have got it at a clinic someplace. But they would start the first staff meeting going over these 29 uh, guidelines to be a great coach. And one of them was don't be sensitive. Mm. You know, I'm going to critique you from time to time. The coordinators are going to critique you from time to time. You, you, what you do – you know, who's in charge changes from time to time. We had a, a big alumni event the other day. You know, I was a peon and a couple of my football ops guy and our director of uh, on-campus recruiting, they were running the meeting. You know, and I was listening and they were telling me what to do. So it changes based on the the, the situation. And then uh, something else I got from uh, uh, Bill Snyder. I think Bill Snyder, you know, the, the greatest, you know, Michael played for me and then went up and played for Coach Snyder up there at uh, uh, Kansas State for a couple of years. I had a couple other kids that went up there and played as well. And he gave, granted me full access. I remember I went up there and nobody was – there was not a visiting coach watching their practice. And I was, I was shocked. I thought there would have been 500 of them. You know, and, and, uh, and um, Mike Stoops was the D coordinator at the time. And I said, how come there's not any other coaches up here? He said – if you wouldn't have given us number seven, you wouldn't be here either. Because his coach doesn't allow anybody. Yeah. But coach had but coach had a tape recorder. And you know, he would I, I was always, you know, I was a head coach, I was a D coordinator, I was a special teams coach. I would stop and I'd try to write stuff down and I'd lose my train of thought and I couldn't see what was going on. So I so I, I started doing this back in the early nineties, I guess. And you know, I got got all these notes here from from the meetings from this morning. You know, I'm getting ready to have the staff meeting, and uh, I don't know how guys remember all that stuff. You know, I don't know if I've got some timers now. Sometimes I remember, sometimes I don't. But but it's hard to remember all the stuff that's going on, and that was a valuable, you know, gift that uh, Coach Snyder gave me. Well, and the it goes back to the the feedback idea, and, and even giving yourself feedback, and a lot of times how you present, right? And, and as an assistant coach, sometimes they're they're not so willing to give feedback to the head coach really bluntly and really directly. And and but if you can hear yourself, besides capturing other things or 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 writing notes down or or recording them, right? Information carefully recorded is information there in a time of need. And man, as the head coach, so many decisions are to be made and so frequently and you, you always have to be ready with the right um, information at the right time to move your program forward, which is what's happened at Tulane. I, I, as I watch the, and I'm sure this is the most frequent question, but I, I'd like to ask it in a different way from 
from a struggling season. And my first year at Virginia, we were two and ten before getting bowl eligible. Then, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, so the um, I was I'm wondering because you mentioned consistency before, and as you as you had a year that was a challenge, and then you had an amazing year right on the heels of that. Did your sense of like who you were and your feelings about yourself change? Um, so your self concept, did you feel that you were still a qualified and skilled coach at two and ten versus the Cotton Bowl? And how much did the results and the outcome facilitate maybe how right you felt? And I know what wins feel like and losses, uh, but I'd never been through anything like a two and ten year before. And I was I was struck by uh, I thought I was immune to a maybe self doubt or questions. And man, that was, that was a, a challenge. Um, and then over time it plays out and the success happens again, but just, I would love to hear maybe the contrast uh, or if there was any for you personally, as you went through, they, maybe that biggest swing. Well, you, you got to believe in what you're doing, you know, and uh, we, we, we didn't change much at all from yeah. one year to the next. We had a different year. We had hurricane Ida. You know, I kind of tell people we had two COVID years, you know, mm -hmm. so we, we had COVID that everybody, had and then the next year, uh, you know, I told the guys to pack during preseason camp. We we're, you know, going to go over to Birmingham, Alabama, and I said pack for three days and we we're there 27 nights. You know, we brought it's like Noah's Ark. You know, we brought yeah. 31 dogs and, <laughs> and cats and everything. You know, and and uh, and I and I tell everybody all the time, I'm just proud of our guys. That season, I was the next season. Had very few issues, problems. Uh, we were competitive, but we didn't get the result we wanted to have. Mm -hmm. and first thing you look at is yourself. Sure. You look at your co coaching staff. You look at your players. Uh, and it was a combination of a lot of things. You know, people ask me, what was the reason for your success this year? Well, it was a lot of things. You know, what was the reason why we didn't have success a year, two years ago? A lot of things. You know, and you got to identify – you know, what you did good, what you did bad, what you need to change, what you need to keep. You know, so we did make some changes, but uh, we, we didn't uh, – philosophically, there, there wasn't any change. Yeah. The, um, as, you, as you mentioned earlier and just in our conversation, the social media influence on players and, and running your program now, do you have specific guidelines and guardrails and rules around that? How do you educate and how are you helping the young people deal with that, right? With the, the craving of the likes and the visibility and the praise that comes with that. And I'd love to hear how you handle that um, or what advice you'd give others. Well, you got the NIL part too, but it, yeah. it's, uh, you know, the, the big thing we I, I do is I have my coaches, my players have to follow their position coach and my position coaches have to follow their, their position group, you know, and, and, and when something happens and uh, which we've had very few instances of, you know, I, I want that position coach to be able to tell me pronto yeah. and call the kids to get that thing down now, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's like, uh, and we, we prep them and we, we have classes and all those kind of things. And, you know, a lot, a lot of it, you know, is the spur of the moment. Where they, they you know push sand, we all tell them, hey, you think ten times before you push sand, you know, especially for misspellings, all those different kind of things. I see that happen all the time, as well. I see it happen with some of my coaches from time to time, but uh, you know, when we when we are uh, recruiting a coach, we look at their social media, big time, you know, and and uh, it's no different for these guys. And they go back years and you and you think you can erase it. You can't erase it. They find it. You know, I, I've uh, uh, was was going to hire a guy about six, seven years ago, and there was some that he had deleted, but the company that we use to do background check was able to see something that was inappropriate. And there was no, we weren't going to hire the guy, plain and simply, even though, even though it happened a long time ago. You know, so there, there's repercussions that occur you know, for, for doing some spur of the moment. So you better think about it. Yeah. And, and man, and young people, and sometimes even older people are impulsive yeah. and, and you send something or you say something or you emailed something or texted something before. And as soon as you send it, it doesn't take a, about a few minutes and you realize, Oh, 
I, that was a mistake and there was an impulse there. And I think you mentioned consistency earlier, which to me is is so important in today's today's world of leaders developing young people. And and yes, some of those decisions you don't get back and the impacts are lasting, just like you said, and trying to influence and educate young people in that way. And I still think um, that coaches are educators first and foremost. You and I, I still think coaches are mentors first and foremost. And I still think coaches are leaders and the influence you have first and foremost and so here's college football, right? And here's the NIL and here's the transfer portal and here's the new TV contracts and here's realignment and here's all the stuff inside of that. And still um, paramount to override all that is the influence of amazing, an amazing teacher um, at the at, at the helm. And so to hear your experiences of teaching uh, physical education at an elementary school, right, while you're a high school coach. It qualifies you in a unique way. So many um, influencers now that go to be head coaches, right? They led the nation on offense or defense as a coordinator. So now they're a head coach. And prior to that, they've been an assistant coach and maybe a GA. Um, but the extra layer that that prepared you, junior college coach, right? High school coach, <laughs> elementary school teacher and wisdom over time. I, I see a real need still for um, leadership and teaching and mentorship and would love just to hear your thoughts on that in, in our world of college football today. Well, I was, I, you know, I was blessed. I, you know, I talked about coach Foster and coach Randall and, you know, I had two really strong role models for me. My old man was a coach. Mm. You know, I, I grew up that way as well. And, and I just think it's, uh, that's why I got into coaching. If I, I'd have been, a, you know, around a bunch of idiots, <laughs> didn't have my best interest at heart. I, I wouldn't want to be a coach. I, no way I would have done it. And uh, so I've, I've stolen a lot of what I do from those guys and different coaches. And then also, obviously, you got to be yourself. Uh, you know, as we were talking about some, uh, you know, not as uh, – maybe I'm not as tough as I was years ago. You know, the, the best time I had, and Jeff was with me on a bunch of these, Jeff Conway, was a couple springs ago – when people were playing football in the spring, you know, cause, cause I never get to go to a game, you know, during the season, I'm, I'm busy coaching, you know? And then, so uh, we went, we had a reunion at Coffeyville and we had a reunion at, at Sam Houston and we had a reunion at Blinn and we had a ton of guys show up at each different place. But, you know, the thing that they all mentioned, they, they talked about the tough things and the discipline and, getting after them. And if, if we hadn't have done that, there might've been a different outcome in their life, you know? And so obviously that's very gratifying, but, you know, as a, as a coach, you know, and, and oftentimes it's the assistant coach, it's the position coach who has the great impact a lot more than the head coach or the strength coach. They're around those guys more than, more than I am or the assistant coaches. Uh, but, but I think it was a uh, tremendous, because we are all our staffs come back for these reunions too. And I think it was really neat to see the connection between those guys. And, and uh, you know, Friday night, I had a big, you know, uh, Letterman's uh, reunion here at Tulane. And I invited a bunch of the coaches that coach these guys. I'm lucky enough to know a bunch of them. And it was really neat to see the relationship. Some of those guys were pl played in the sixties with their coaches from the, you know, and, and uh, just, it's a, uh, you know, you, you get a platform to have a heck of a, you know, an influence on these guys and uh, you need to take advantage of it. You know, so, so many times and what the research keeps backing up is one of the greatest gifts you can give anyone is the gift of high expectations. That doesn't mean in place of relationships. What this is the high expectations on performance with high level relationships, right? That combination together ends up producing um a tangible kind of bond that you can't be formed another way. And so I, I think that's what you're talking about. Those coaches that, and that come back or the players that talk to you and, and they almost always remember the hardest things you asked them to do yeah. more even than the games. And, and, and then they become grateful for that over time. And, and you hope, right. That they then raise their kids or influence them that way. When you're, as you mentioned, your strength coach and your other coaches, uh, and I'm sure you're very specific now and really clear about um, what traits that 
matter most to you to have around you on your staff and and what qualities if you were to i don't know to share and advise um other uh, other coaches as they're considering you know qualities and traits uh, and this will be specific to you because it's your program and, and you're authentic, as you mentioned, and right? So you want alignment that way. But what qualities and traits do you think really um, are important? If you're hiring a strength coach, if you're hiring coaching staff, who do you want around you and, and how come? Not everybody's going to be the same. Number one is a good person. I, that's that's huge for me. I have no desire to work 100 hours a week around it. Excuse my language, a jackass. Yep. I just don't have any desire to do it. And and uh, so I, I want good people and I got to find somebody, you know, I, I'm not a, uh, a big phone guy where I call all these coaches, you know, my guys, the guys I talk to that I coach with or guys I coach with at Coffeeville or Blinn or, you know, places like that. So I'm not in the know with a lot of these division one coaches, but I got to find somebody that, that I know who will give me the, the, the real scoop on this guy. You know, and then something else we were talking about younger coaches, and I think it's a, a a real art to be able to get after guys in meetings out there on the field when it when they need to be getting it, they, someone needs to get after them, and still have that great relationship with them. Yes, you know, some guys cannot do that. They 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 just they don't they don't know how to. How, they don't have that relationship or the presentation, you know, to, to, to deliver that message. And I try to find guys like that because, you know, uh, I think that's so important, not just for your football program, but for them. I, I tell guys all the time, you, you know, a guy's late for something. I say, you know what happens when you get a job and you're late? What, you get fired? That's what happened. My coaches came in here late all the time. I, we'd be, you'd see another coach sitting in their office. I was late all the time. The AD would get, get rid of my butt and he'd bring somebody else in here. You know, so that's what really I think the discipline is also all about is when they, when they go out in the real world and they figure out it's not, it's not about them, it's not about me. Certainly it's about taking care of wherever you're working at. And, uh, you know, it's, it's so important for us recruiting. We're a school like, you know, Virginia. You know, we're the 39th ranked school academically in the country out of 4,140 colleges and universities. I tell my, my coaches, hey, try to find guys who've had a good 18 years. If they, they've had a good 18 years, we're going to do a great job of polishing and shining them and, you know, and, and helping them make that transition from 18 to 22. If they had a bad 18 years, it makes it difficult. And that's, that's what I think a lot of people get into trouble with. They, just, they, they look at the talent and not the other part and, Three years later, there's all sorts of problems. They don't have the culture, and they're not there anymore. You know that it's it's a, it's an alluring thing, um, and, and I love the idea of consistency in 18 years. You're not saying he had a good senior year, and you're not saying he had a good junior year, right? You're saying he had a good 18 years, and and so many I think coaches, especially if the talent is exceptional, when they gets when we get him, we'll fix him. When when, when he comes to us, you know, we'll we'll get all this ironed out. And I also learned one time, one of the best predictors of future performance is past performance, right? When it replicates, when it's in the same area. <laughs> and, and so this idea that um, 18 years isn't a relative um, resume, it certainly is. And, and so to take on, and, and as you mentioned at, at Tulane and, and Virginia as well, I, I felt really lucky for the standards that are there and, and who that would attract. Um, and really worked hard on on presenting that to the coaches of how lucky we are and to find people that fit and want these expectations, not viewing them as something that's challenging, but that want to strive for that because this is now an additional component, right? Here's amazing football, but there's also now amazing academics and, and they better want both because the expectations are so high. And the idea I, I, I heard so often is, yeah, I struggled a little bit here and anyone can recover. I believe that. Now the time, energy, and effort, and does does your program have the resources to do that? And how many can you do that with um, to really give them their best chance? It's an alluring thing, and so I love the the eighteen year kind of uh, metric. If you were to say in the recruiting world now, as you talked a little bit earlier about the NIL, um, 
in that space recently, how big a shift do you see or or do you see at a place like Tulane, right, which which has such academic rigor and prestige? Do you see the NIL space on the front end? I'm talking about the selection and assessment and recruiting process. Is that is that affecting you? And if so, like, how are you having to adapt and, and work with that or not so much maybe at Tulane? I was going to hit on the other points you made. You know, some of my coaches, this guy just wants to hear about football. Well, he's not going to fit here. Exactly. He's exactly. not going to fit here because that's what I push. You know, I, I just think the coaches who just talk about pro football all the time. We're lucky we got 15 guys playing in the NFL. That's pretty good. I've coached over a thousand dudes here. You know, maybe not a thousand, but 700. Yeah. You know, or whatever it is. You know, but it's a lot. And so that's it, hard. It's hard to make it into the NFL. You know, so we don't, we talk about that. We talk about a parallel plan, right? Get this degree, it's going to help you the next 40 years of your life and aspire to play in the NFL. But this is the one I talk about all the time. I guess I'm I'm a grandpa now. I just had my first grandson here. Oh, That's Wednesday. So <laughs> it's grandpa speak right now. But the NIL, we do not touch it on the front end. You know, we, we just we tell, tell kids, you come here, you know, all of our kids have got some kind of, deal you know but if it's a and i do think the kids deserve it i i do you know some of our coaching brethren that think no oh, they shouldn't have it this that and the other well it's here number one so you better adapt to it yep. you know and, and, and number two i do think there's a lot of money to be had out there in division one football you know i i had a kid that played for me at, at same houston state it's all-time leading rusher in school history and and uh Great player. He'll, he'll be in the College Football Hall of Fame someday. But, you know, every there, there'd be 500 people wearing his jersey in the stands. You know, and, and, and those jerseys were a bunch of money. And I, I felt like his parents and family deserved to get free jerseys, <laughs> at least, you know, but that's breaking a rule. So he couldn't do that. You know, so there needs to be something that's done. Uh, so we don't we don't do anything on the front end. I tell kids all the time, Coach, how can I get more NIL money? I say, well, play better. Yeah. Play better. I get you best. I, I, I guess you'll get more opportunities. You know, so we've, we've done well with it because we're in a big city. Yeah. You know, we've had alums that are, we're a big med school, we're a big law school. Uh, you know, I got three guys uh, that played football or lawyers or started a collective, which a lot of people across the country are, you know, trying to copy and, and, uh, but we're not doing it on the front end. And you know the people who ask me? It's the parents. Yeah. When they come on their visit, they ask me about NIL. It's not the kids. Yeah. I think we've lost maybe two kids in the last two years because I didn't answer that question the way they wanted me to answer it. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's about it. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's such a, an interesting influence. And, and I, I'm not necessarily the most popular. Um, my, my stance has been regarding that, and I also believe – um, that there's a meritocracy and the real world works in the free market based on performance. And, and so I don't have any issues with that, nor the portal as well. Um, and, and for this, for this reason, I, I love that the portal holds coaches accountable and how the kids are treated in their own program, right. And where they fit and how much they're playing and what the relationships are like. And, and I think there's an accountability element that that holds us as coaches and programs to. Here, here's what I don't like about the portal. Okay. Number one, there's illegal recruiting. I had, a, I had a bunch of people illegally, illegally recruit some of my players this past year, and I actually called the coaches. Mm. Now, they denied up and down, right? <laughs> but but the, some people have a – they're confused about what indirect contact is. <laughs> it means, you know, it's having their players on their team call this guy that, that knows them, high school coach, parents, friend, collective, whoever's contact. So that's number one. And the other part about the portal – it's getting ready to happen. These guys are going to make room. All right. And, and that was not the intent in any way, shape, or form. All right. And that's not how it was three years ago. Right. You had a kid in there and, you know, hey, Ben Knutson. Right. Ben was playing for you after he got after he got his degree from Virginia. All right. Grad transfer. He came and played for me at Tulane. Okay, and that's that's how it worked. That's how it's supposed to work. So that that's uh, that's something I think is uh, you know that I I've heard a couple of people talk about that. 
yeah. you know, a, few, a few of the D1 head coaches that I do know that I'm friends with have kind of like, oh, wait a second, I don't think that's what it was supposed to be. And the, the, so the, the concept itself, and I think there's, there's kind of two different points and your points are valid. And as, as working with the AFCA board of directors and all that, um, we, we knew as the legislation was coming down NIL, as well as the transfer portal, that the, the place that the governance was struggling the most already was in the world of recruiting. This is prior to any of that, right. In terms of illegal contacts and different things. That was the, the area I thought um, and we thought within the NCA that was struggling the most in terms of enforcement, consistency and the complaints. So we knew as soon as the transfer portal slash NIL became relevant, right? The place that that was gonna be affected most was in the most unoccupied space in terms of enforcement or struggling. And that was the front end, which is to your point. And, and so, all it did was magnify an existing weakness that was already struggling in terms of an enforcement and consistency. And so what you're saying is I still, I still think is right on. It just has made it even more difficult in the third parties and having that defined, but really who regulates that. And so the coaches that will call another head coach, right. That's certainly a start. Um, and yeah, but it's, not, it's not anywhere where it needs to be. I mean, it's, and, and that's, that's uh you know, on the money part of it too, I, I got an interesting story. I think about a kid named uh, Darnell Mooney played for me here at Tulane. He's a top receiver for the uh, Chicago Bears. Now I think he had 60, <laughs> 63 catches last year. Dar Darn we were his only Division One offer. Darnell saved per diem. This is before NIL. You know, stipend, Pell Grant, uh, uh, cost of attendance. And when he graduated from here, and I think he graduated in three and a half years, he had fifty-two thousand dollars in the bank. You know, and I, I wish there was a way that we could get that money on the when they graduate. Mm -hmm. They really don't need it while they're going to school. Yeah, they do, and they don't, right? But they get this money when they graduate, and now, irregardless of whether they play pro football or not, they've got a good, good beginning. In, in, you know, in, in their life, you know, and and because uh, and we educate them just like everybody does, but you know, educating them and you know, getting some money and saying I need to get some rims for my tires, you know, and instead of saving it, two different things. It, it's very similar to the impulses on social media and decisions over the long term, right? The long game is really what we're trying to influence in leadership and et cetera. And so, this idea of saving money or transferring after graduation or completing um, a task before moving on, there's value in that. Um, and there's also the, the example that we set and most of us as head coaches, and I've done it as well, right? And, and if a coach is leaving one institution for the other, it's normally for a higher level, it's normally for bigger opportunities, it's normally for advancement. And so I see that happening with young people now. And there's many coaches that take issues with it. I don't have issues with the concept. What I do is the governance of how that happens Right. There's and that was to your point. Right. If the how is is above board and is fair, what's happening now is young people are making decisions that as coaches I've made before. And and man, does it hurt? In some cases, if they do leave, I always look at myself, how come? And and, and almost every as I look at the portal, uh, a lot of it. Um, and I can't say now with the influence of money, I, I really can't because <laughs> I don't have those numbers. But most of the time, kids want another level or to play or they want the role to be expanded. Now, though, there's a monetary element that's added into that. And so going back to your influence and you're being steady and you having great relationships and you bring the right kids to your program. Wow. Does that minimize? Uh, I don't think it completely eliminates. But at Virginia, and this was a couple of years ago. It was the, the third fewest in the transfer portal. Um, when you build strong programs like you have. Uh, the, the kids, they're, they're, they're looking for more reasons to stay than to leave, uh, to be with their coaches, to be with their peers, to be with their team, to learn the lessons that they believe in from a mentor. And, and so, man, I, I think it almost doubles down on our influence. And to hear your thoughts on just on that and why they stay and why they leave and, and what you're seeing. Well, we haven't had very many leave. And sometimes it's been like a, a, a kid like Ben who wanted to play a little bit more, yeah. already had his degree. Yep. You know, and, and there was a need here at Tulane for his position. And a guy's got an undergrad degree from Virginia and a graduate degree from Tulane. Pretty good. 
Awesome. Uh, but, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I happened to hear from him yesterday, as a matter of fact, just <laughs> coincidentally. Uh, but I, I just think, you know, it's sometimes there's not a lot of thought involved in it. We had a lot of success this year, and it was, it was interesting to me that a lot of these guys, not all of them, but we've had maybe, we've lost maybe 12, 14 guys over the last couple of years, hmm. which is not very many. And yeah. some of the guys, it was, it was playing time. I understand that. Some of the guys that already graduated, I understand that. But they 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 come back and they want to still be here. Did, did you have that, Bronco? I, I did. I did. And you're 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 kind of like now wait a second, you know, yeah. Uh, you know, so yeah. that, that's that's something that I think sometimes people don't think about. Yeah. You know, we're, we're I know you got this, you know, this you know, a, a box full of money or whatever that to go someplace else, you know, what what, what, what reunion you're going to in 20 years. And I just listened to all these two lane guys last Friday night. I mean, it was, it was like those guys had been talking every day. Yeah. You know what I mean? Since, since they graduate. And some of them hadn't seen each other in 10, 20 years. You know, and, and uh, you know, go ahead. I, I love, I love the idea and the question, what reunion are you going to? That that is that's a that's a powerful uh, and sometimes asking the right question to these kids before they choose <laughs> that's it, to find the right words and to frame it correctly to overcome the impulse. I, well, I think that's what parents really work hard to do, right? As you're raising your own kids, you and, you and I think we're just an extension of that. But sp speaking of of the of that part, you just mentioned grandkids a little while ago, or your first one. Yeah. Love to hear between you and your wife. How have you navigated having your family just be amazing through all that happens in college football and the, the time spent and the hours and the stress and et cetera. And, um, and that doesn't all mean that it has to be negative, right? There's amazing relationships and families built through this profession. Would love just to hear your thoughts on for the coaches thinking about, you know, keeping their families uh, thriving and doing the best they can that way and the joy of being a grandparent, et cetera. I'm I'm probably a little a little bit like you. I, I don't have very many hobbies. You know, I uh, I don't fish. I don't hunt. I don't golf. Um, I work out a little bit, coach ball, and hang with my family. That's you know because you just don't have a lot of time in this occupation. You know, I I uh, my wife used to try to get me to golf years and years ago. I said you're crazy. If I you, you'll be so mad at me. It's, it's six hours out of my free time. You know, and I don't have enough free time as it is. So uh, our kids are very involved in our program. They they love wherever I'm at, you know, and and uh, they jump right in. And my uh, uh, my son works for me. Hmm. You know, when I was at Sam Houston State, he was he played basketball there. And then my oldest daughter was on the dance team. That was always a thrill coming out for a game, and she'd give me a big old hug before I went on the sideline. And and uh, uh, my two of them live in Houston, and my two daughters. And my son works here. He's the one who who gifted us a, a grandchild here last Wednesday. But you know, I just I don't know. I just I'm pretty pretty simple guy. They, they asked me my uh, hobbies. At one of these deals I was at the other day, and I said sitting in my pool drinking a couple of natty lights. I don't I don't have a whole lot of hobbies, or you know, I'm just hanging with my family all the time. And and, uh, and luckily for me, I found a a woman who loved living in Coffeyville, Kansas, and Huntsville, Texas, and Brenham, Texas, and Warrensburg, Missouri, places like that. So I took her around the world, some great spots. <laughs> so the, the uh, I, I love the kind of finishing as we conclude uh, an amazing uh, woman or wife uh, who is self-reliant and independent and passionate and can adapt and adjust and just an amazing capable partner um most head coaches that i've seen over time that have lasted and that have had success and that have, have found not only success on the field but off while wow, the the wife slash mom and and what they do is is uh is actually just uh, um is monumental and inspiring uh, that how fast they can pull so many things together and and move a family and adjust and and adapt and I'm so grateful for for Holly and it sounds like that um, uh, that you 
your relationship has been similar and and the fulfillment of coaching without that doesn't go as as far nor is it as profound and so i, I think as you mentioned right where your time is spent that's where your priorities are and so um, my reason not to golf is none of my kids golf <laughs> why, 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 why would i go spend four and a half hours doing something so the only things that I enjoy are the things my kids love and those become my hobbies. And so I can be with them. If I'm not with my wife, but I just, I really appreciate your perspective. I appreciate the example, I, the, the, the kind of program you're running and, and luckily the success, and maybe it's not luckily, maybe that's, a, it, it's a byproduct of, but I, I think the values with the success is the more programs that in college football that can have that, the better the game will be. But the game is to serve young people, right? And that that means more young people benefit. And to me, the the tribute of that is: do they do they still keep in contact with you? Which we've talked so much already that they have. And so the influence that you're having, I think, is great. So we we just really appreciate you joining us and sharing. Well, thank you for having me on, and, and this is a really great platform for young coaches to learn about what it is all about uh, being a head coach. You know, I, sometimes the young coaches that. I think they want my job. You know, they, they come to the programs. Like, you know, it took me a long time to get around these bases, you know, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, one of the things when I speak at this clinic this weekend or other clinics that I talk to, talk at is, you know, like, like we talked about earlier, I've loved it every place I've been, you know, and I, I think if you don't enjoy the journey, there's why get into it. And, uh, you know, so thank you all for having me on. I appreciate it. It's been really fun. Brian, you want to close us out? Yeah, a second, second, just what Bronco said, uh, Willie. I mean, it, it was fantastic conversation, and uh, we'll have to do it again as as well uh, down the road. I'm I'm sure there, there's still so much that we could could get into. We, I know you just were were named to uh, to the AFC board, so uh, between you and, and your AD there, Troy Dan, and uh, running football oversight, uh, you, know, you guys have, have a pulse on on the future of the game as well. But uh, we appreciate you you taking the time to stop by and, and chat about uh, everything that's gone on in your career. Well, thank you all for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, for Willie Fritz and for Bronco Mendenhall, I'm Brian Fisher, and we'll catch you again on the next episode of Head Coach Yorkers.